Um, I don't have a lot of missionary during the year, but uh, we've got one t this morning, and uh, they're going to present their work um, in Sunday school, and he's going to preach in church, and so it's going to be a great day today. And uh, so without further ado, I'm going to have him come introduce his family to us, because I can't remember all the boys' names, and, uh, and his wife, and uh, we'll turn the service over to them. morning to you. This is my wife right here. I go to churches sometimes and people will say, is that your wife? And we walk in together and I kind of just smile and laugh. Mm -hmm. I don't know who else you'd travel to church with. <laughs> okay. And then this is here. Starting from the right, we've got Marshall. Hi. And then Donovan, he's actually the oldest. Donovan is. Jeremiah, he's our, he's our bucket of fun. And then there's Isaiah. He's our youngest, so he gets away with anything. So, all right, we are the Cermak family headed to the country of Papua New Guinea. We'll show a video in just a minute. Uh, but if you would take your Bibles, turn to Acts 16. I'll show you a few things. Acts 16. Uh, we put together a little, little video to show you not just where we're going, who we are, that's important. I grew up in church my whole life. I've uh, been a Baptist before I was saved. Hopefully you understand that that's possible. Uh, and um, I grew up watching missionary videos from the front pew of a church, and I learned a whole lot of bad geography. <laughs> uh, but I learned, learned a lot about countries, learned a lot about the need for the gospel to go around the world. Uh, but usually what we walked away from, and I'm not, it's not a critique, it's just as a kid what you paid attention to, I didn't learn a whole lot about the missionary himself. And so we put together a little video that tells you, uh, the first half will be about just about who we are, where we've been, what the Lord has allowed us to do, uh, not in a boasting manner, but just in, in to serve God at all, to get the opportunity to serve him, is just his graciousness to us. Uh, the Bible says in Thessalonians, we are allowed of God we put in trust with the gospel. So that being said, we'll share that with you, and then we'll show you with you the calling God has given us to the island of Papua New Guinea. But in Acts 16, I want to show you a few things first that, um, that might be a help to you. In Acts 16, we find an interesting uh, passage often used in light of missions. Uh, Acts 13, you don't have to turn there. In Acts 13, uh, there's a church in Antioch the place where the book of Acts says the Christian, they were first called Christians. In Antioch, if you study your, your book of Acts, there was a lot of controversy in the, in, the, uh, in the city of Jerusalem. And basically, persecution really picked up quickly. And so, if you want to use the terminology, the capital of Christianity, I don't know if you want to use that or not, but basically, Christianity Center moved to Antioch in Syria there. The Bible says in Acts 13 that Paul and Barnabas were sent out by the church to the work that God had called them to do. The Holy Spirit was in that thing, all that. And so, so you've got a few chapters of their ministry by this point. And Acts 16 is what we call the Macedonian call. If you've ever seen the, or ever sang that song, Send the Light, there's a verse in there. We've heard the Macedonian. That's not Macadamian. Uh, you know, I heard the Macadamian cookie today. <laughs> I heard the Macedonian call, and this is what it's referring to here in Acts 16. So look what it says. Um, the Bible says in verse 6, Now when they were gone throughout uh, Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. And they were come to My Mycenae, and they swayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. So here's Paul the Apostle, and, and, and fellows there with him, they're, they're trying to, we want to go this direction, the Holy Spirit kind of shuts that door, and they want to go this direction, the Holy Spirit kind of shuts that door. And then the Bible says here, and they passing by Asia came to Troas, verse 9, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. And hopefully you understand that since you've got a complete Bible, we're not putting a whole lot of stock nowadays into visions, but God used those things in that time, and that's not the topic this morning. But look what it says. There stood a man of Macedonia. And prayed him, saying, come over into Macedonia, and look at these three words, and help us. He didn't say do everything for us. <laughs> he didn't say come 
come turn us into miniature Americans or miniature Israelites. He says, he says, come and help us. There's some people crying for help. Now, if you read the chapter, we won't for sake of time because I'm going to show you a video and then talk about New Guinea. But, but uh, if you study it, Paul the Apostle, I, I don't know that he really runs into that man. He gets down there and he ends up at a prayer meeting with some ladies. And some folks get saved, and then he really helps a lady who's got some, some real in, inflictions to the point where it gets him thrown in jail. And then when he gets in jail, the, the, the man we run into there is the Philippian jailer. And that Philippian jailer gets saved. We love that story there. And really goes on his way after that. It, it really, in, in the light of modern churches today, it's not a huge success story. But really, if you study the, there in Macedonia and Philippi, Seems like from there really springs forth a great, forth a great effort. The Lord really uses that to the, to the point where there's impact even to this day from that that happened there. But it started with somebody saying to Paul the Apostle, come help us. And so our ministry is, is we're not comparing ourselves to Paul the Apostle. But what we're presenting to you is that in a few minutes you'll see on the video some folks that are saying, come help us. Uh, there's There's... And we'll talk about New Guinea, New Guinea in a little bit, about the, the amount of missionaries that are already gone and the need for those to, to continue to go and the work that is still yet to be accomplished. But uh, there's some folks that are saying, come and, come and help us. And um, that's our Macedonian call. And so we want to share that with you in just a minute. And, and I don't know what lies ahead. I don't, know if, I, don't, I don't know because we just trust the Lord, amen? But when we get there, we may meet a group of women that are that are having a prayer meeting. may meet somebody that's, anyway, on you go. We may end up in jail. I don't know. But we follow the Lord. So let's show this video, and I, and I think that will kind of uh, show you a little bit about our ministry, who we are, and then we'll talk more in depth about it afterwards, if that's okay. Provide a 
public ministry, such as street preaching and track distribution at festivals and many parades. We were also able to be involved in door-to-door ministries, as well as nursing home ministries and volunteering at the homeless shelter by providing meals and preaching the gospel every Friday night. We also were given the wonderful opportunity of being on two different local radio stations every Sunday morning, providing Bible preaching and teaching in this area. Overall, the Lord greatly blessed by giving us wonderful chances to preach the gospel for Him and by providing biblical teaching to the members of this church on a weekly basis. We thank the Lord for the wonderful time we were able to spend here in Brunswick, Georgia, and the blessings that we were able to see come forth, not only in ourselves, but in the members of this church. In October of 2018, my wife and I had the wonderful chance to go to Papua New Guinea for a two-week missions trip. I enjoyed meeting the brethren there, as well as helping them with many of the outreach endeavors they're doing in that area. I also had a great opportunity to preach at special meetings for some of the churches in Mount Hawley. It was during our time there that the Lord broke my heart and showed me a need for the brethren in that area. In 2017, the brethren of Papua New Guinea received the King James Bible in their own language. But sadly, many of them have not been taught the sound doctrine contained in the pages of that very Bible. What we realized when we were there on this trip is that many of the churches are suffering due to the attacks of false teachers, religions, and many cults that are coming in and leading so many brethren away. After returning home, the Lord continued to deal with my heart about the need for someone to go to Papua New Guinea and provide biblical training for those young men who would be going into the gospel ministry. After much prayer, counsel, and biblical examination, the Lord confirmed to my heart we would have our family move to the city of Mount Harley and establish a local Bible institute that would be a help to the churches there in training their young men in the gospel ministry. When I surrendered to this call, I was unaware that many of the pastors in the Mount Hong area had already been meeting together for almost two years, asking God to send someone to fulfill this exact need. It was a great blessing to us. But on opposite ends of the globe, we realized that the Lord was answering their prayers by sending our family to the country of Papua New Guinea. Hi, my name is Douglas Kumi. I'm the pastor of Mount Darwin Baptist Temple. I've been a pastor since 1989. We have a great need in this country, especially for this church that I represent. I would like somebody to come and help me to uh, start a Bible institute. Because what I see, when we send their students to other schools, they kind of become, become followers of those schools. And I uh, would like to see some homegrown uh, missionaries and preachers going out of this uh, church. Therefore, I would like uh, somebody to come and help us. And Brother Kenny has put his hand up to want to come and help us. And I'm so much grateful. In fact, that's the answer prayer uh, to our prayers wanting to see a Bible Institute started as soon as we can. And if we can have Brother Kenny come over and help us, we would be so much appreciative of that. Hi, I'm Pastor Fred Gallo from Exodus Baptist Church, serving the Lord in this church for 20 years now. And having pastors preachers under me, we have a great need. The need is that we need someone who can come and teach the solid teachings of the Word of God. Because uh, this is what the country needs. Uh, I do appreciate some of our missionaries came did a great job, but we still have need, especially in the area of uh, solid teaching of the Word of God. And uh, that is our need. We have been praying. And uh, when Pastor Kenny and his wife came and preached for four nights, uh, I could see that that was a kind of teaching that we really wanted it. And uh, I believe if the Lord calls them to our country, that would be a big plus for us. We would love to have them come and help us teach the word of God. Thank you so much. We are excited to be headed to Papua New Guinea to provide a Bible <laughs> institute for the young man of the Mount Hogan area so that 
they can be taught the Word of God, and therefore go also into the highland region of New Guinea and reach their own people with the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and plant indigenous, solid, Bible-believing churches. So, brethren, we ask that you consider partnering with us, both prayerfully and financially, that we might be able to go to poverty again and fulfill this great work that God has given us to do. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> just long enough for you to get a good nap. Uh, we'll make a few clarifications, maybe, or some comments for you. Uh, Pastor Cumulus, the first man on that video to speak, other than me, <laughs> the first New Guinean guy, he makes a statement in there that I want to I want to talk about for a minute. He says, "When men go to these other schools, they become followers of those schools," <clears throat> and he is not referring to a a big epidemic we have in the in this country, in the United States of America, is that we have we have our brethren, our independent Baptist brethren. We really struggle to get along because of where we went to school. Really, is what it is. And my favorite preacher and your favorite preacher didn't like each other 50 years ago, and they're both dead. I can't like you because it it's an epidemic, and really we we struggle to get a lot done because of that. And I'm going to tell you there isn't brethren to stay away from for certain reasons, but. That is not what he's referring to there. What he's referring to is about uh, probably a half mile to three quarters of a mile from his church is a place where the Catholics hold studies and even have a seminary. He's referring to the other side of town, the charismatic movement, which, by the way, is the fastest growing religion in Papua New Guinea. The Catholics own the most ground, but the charismatics are taking the most quickly. They have a, a place where men can learn, quote, unquote, learn the Bible. And uh, what, what that does is these men get saved, young ladies get saved, and a natural reaction, if you're, if you're saved this morning, a natural reaction occurred within you, a desire you didn't have before to learn this book. It was a natural desire. Um, <clears throat> it's the words of your Savior. I mean, if you're, if you're the bride of Christ, it's the words of your bridegroom. It's a natural desire to want to learn this thing. And so these men are so hungry for the word, they go to church, they're faithful to their churches, but what ends up happening is they just want more, and that's natural. And they want more because they want, to, they want to reach their own people. So they go down to the street to these churches thinking they have in their novice pride, which we've all had. Some of us still do at times. They go down to that, that place thinking they can spit out the bones and keep the meat, and they can't. And what we end up seeing is men who, are, who we believe are saved. We're not telling you they're not born again. What we're telling you is they go down there. And they get ate up into the, the tongues movement or they'll get all up into the, you know, they just really, really are not grounded in their Bibles. And so what those men are is they're saved, but they've become ineffectual to the furtherance of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. What, uh, what the pastors over there have recognized is that <clears throat> they have had, to, had two options. Is you either put your men on a plane to America, which how, how likely is that from a guy that lives in a, <laughs> lives in a hut in the bush? How likely is he going to do that? Or we just have to deal with subpar teaching. And so we've had a real epidemic in, in, in Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea, just for a little bit of background, if you know a whole lot about it, and then I'll take some questions in a minute. But Papua New Guinea, as of 100 years ago, the area we're headed to, they were still eating each other. 100 years ago, there was areas there that didn't know anything about. Now, now granted, the coast have had people for a while. But up in the mountains, there, there's been areas there that, that 100 years ago, 50 years ago even, had never seen a white person. So not that that makes you anything special. I'm just saying that's, that's the advancement level that they're at. In the 50s, 60s, 70s, a great missionary effort went in there. If you ever read a book like Peace Trial and other places, great missionary effort went in there and told people with bones, bones in their noses who were eating each other about Jesus Christ who they never heard before. The three parts to missions is that we tell them the gospel that then develops into salvations, which then, number two, creates churches. And we plant churches, and we leave churches. But the third part that every missionary presents to you is that he wants to train men for the ministry. And many of them are not able to accomplish that simply because time runs out, really. So much work to get folks saved, get a church established, and then you just run out of time, or whatever the reason may be. The reason in Papua New Guinea that that has been lacking 
is for the lack of a good Bible. About 15 years ago, the missionaries just came to a point of utter frustration. They were dealing with a Bible that the best thing we can compare it to in English was good news from modern man. <laughs> Which even the good news from modern man people don't like good news from modern man. <laughs> And they, were, they would take that, and, and here's, here's, what the, here's what the missionary would do. He'd stand up there, and he'd try to train man so that, so that he can leave something when he leaves. That's the goal of missions, is to leave it beyond the life of the missionary. And he'd get up there, and he'd say, okay, men, we're going to learn the Bible. And they'd open their Bibles, good news for modern men's, whatever. And they, he'd say, well, you, you really can't trust that. You've got to trust that what I'm telling you in the English Bible is right, and a Bible you can't read. How do you leave people? in a permanent place where they don't have confidence in their own Bibles. So they got together and they said, we got to do something better than this. We can't keep just complaining about it. We got to fix it. So a big group of missionaries got together. I, I say big group, but for independent Baptists, that many guys getting in harmony together was, was a miracle. These guys got together and they um, incorporated some national pastors who that was their mother tongue. And they developed what came out in 2017. The King James Pigeon Bible. Now, all the brethren want to argue about preservation and perfection. All I say is lay it alongside good news for a modern man, and we're a thousand miles ahead of them. Um, <clears throat> you, know, you can argue about the translation. All I know is it's, it's a very English-based language to a degree, but it's not English. But you can put English words in it. Anyway, so where they didn't have a word for propitiation, they just left propitiation. And when you ran into that word, you had to look it up. And so when they run into it, they'll have to look it up. But they got a Bible in their hand now. And they're so excited. 2017, that's not a long time ago to have a copy of scriptures in your hand. So before that, they had to learn English or just deal with this horrible good news for a modern man deal. So they got a Bible in their hand. And really, that's what we, we say. That's the, the authority for all matters of faith and practice. That's what we say. And so they got one. And now that they got it, what do they do with it? Well, if, you, if you're not... <laughs> If you're not like 2 Timothy 2 says, Paul told Timothy to take which that had been committed unto him and commit to faithful men also, that they could teach others. I mean, it, it's a compounding thing. There's a very, for time we won't go into it, that the Bible lays out for you a doctrine of teaching is so necessary to ground the next generation, to let ministries continue beyond the life of the pastor or the missionary. And that comes from the eternal word of God. They've got that in their hands now, but not knowing how to use that thing. Can be, can be just as deadly as not having one. So the brethren in Papua New Guinea have recognized that. <clears throat> and they said, we need, we need help. Macedonian call, come and help us. Well, as I said, we went there in October. I, I didn't have any intentions of moving there. That wasn't my plan. My plan was to go back to my little church in Brunswick and my nice little job and my little brick house, a big brick house, and, and just live my life. And maybe I'll pray for those guys. And that wasn't the Lord's plan, of course. But we went there, and, and, and what I saw was men so hungry, women so hungry to learn that Bible. It, 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 I preached meetings there that, that they would come and walk six hours, not because I was anything great, but just because somebody's preaching the Bible. And they'd come, and they'd sit there, and you'd get done two hours later. And in America, they'd shoot you for preaching two hours. You'd be voted out the next Sunday. <laughs> but preach two hours, and at the end, they'd say, oh, is that all? They're just so hungry for it over there. And so, um, anyway, so, so we, you know, we, we prayed about going and called a missionary friend of mine over there, the fellow you see in there translating for me. I said, listen, I said, Eric, I said, do you, do you think that this is a ministry? Not that Papua New Guinea needs. We're, you and I are not debating whether or not they need this. Is this a ministry you think they would want? Because my position on this, and I hope, I hope we're in agreement, is that God works through the church. So we got established. Acts 20 says those that are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ have been purchased and been made a part of the church. Amen. That being said, I believe ministries that are worth doing should be done through and under the church of Jesus Amen. Christ. You, you see all across this country where schools have come up and, and Bible colleges have taken over authority. Right. And that just thing ends in heresy. And so I said, well, if we're going to go there and we're going to help these pastors, we are not going to come take over. We want to come work under under their churches and, and create a ministry that, well, one day I can leave and it can still be in place to help those churches. And so I said, do you think they want this? He goes, yes, they need it. They want it. Come on. And I said, I did, well, I want you to ask them. 
right? Oftentimes, our national, international mission field pastors, we don't give them the respect they're due, but there are brethren and they're God-called men of God. I said, ask them if they want this, if they believe this is what God wants. So he asked Pastor Freddie, the second man on the video, uh, Pastor Freddie came to see him and they were sitting there talking and, and that's when I got a phone call in the middle of that conversation. And time changes are rough when they're 14 hours ahead. That's rough when you're waking up to those calls. But, but anyway, so he said, um, I see, he goes, I'm here with Pastor Freddie, and he's crying. I said, what'd you do to him? Come on, man. <laughs> he said, well, here's what he told me. He said, for two years, as I told you in the video, those men had been meeting together. The five, if not more, pastors in the Highland region there of Mount Hagen, in the city of, city of Mount Hagen there, been meeting together for almost five years, or five years, two years, asking God to send someone. And so the missionary says to him, he says, listen, he goes, why didn't you let me know that? You know, here we are, we're already here. And his answer was, he goes, listen, when we come to the American missionaries, they've been a big help to us. They've been a big blessing to us. But Americans are problem solvers. That's what they are. So we need a Bible school. We need a Bible institute. Well, the answer comes about, well, hey, we're just going to, we're going to start a Bible institute. You'd build a building. You'd train some guys. You'd get it done. And then you'd write in your prayer letter, you had it accomplished. And he goes, the training of our men is so vital to the future of this country that we just figured we wouldn't tell you. We would just tell God and let the Holy Spirit work in hearts. Amen. So you can imagine the excitement level of being on the exact opposite side of the globe while the Lord's dealing with me and finding this. It was a pretty exciting conversation, to say the least. So we, we, we said, okay. And we, we've sold everything that we own except what can fit in a camper. And we've hit the road. And the way, the way this works is Papua New Guinea says that if you want to come to our country and be here more than two months on a tourist visa, you have to prove to us you have your own financial stability. That's their law. You're not going to come take our jobs away from our New Guineans. I don't know that I'm going to go dig sweet potatoes anyway, but I would if that's what it took. And, um, and so they said, no jobs if you're not a New Guinean. So prove to us you got your own money and you can come in. That's the reason we're on deputation. I know missionaries do it for many different reasons. The reason we're trying to raise support is because the government said I have to. If they didn't, we would already be there, brethren. So um, we've got men there that are waiting in the city of Mount Hagen. We've got about 40 men between five churches that believe God has called them to do something, that want to learn their Bible and be trained and go out and reach their people, whether it be pastoring or uh, evangelism, whatever it may be, they feel that God wants them to. And I'm not so naive to say all 40 will, but we'll, we'll give them a chance and see if how many are sincere and how many will... How many will do that thing? And hey, if one's willing to do it, we're excited. Since we've announced this, uh, there's, there's a missionary out of our home church. I'm almost done. My wife mentioned in the video she went to work with Brother Wayne Fair, a uh, missionary out of our home church. Brother Wayne Fair will be 70 in about a year and a half. So he'll, he's, he's nearing that age. And you get older quicker there. Hiking mountains and lack of medical, regular medical help makes a man who's 70 look like he's 90. <laughs> but Brother Wayne's he's a trooper and he's been making it, but... His last term will more than likely be our first term there. And, um, <clears throat> and he's been working with a national pastor up in the city of Kaboom, and, uh, which would take you two days of travel to get there from Mount Hagen if you walked it and drove it. But you can get there in an hour on a little prop job plane, so you can figure out which way we're going to get there. And this pastor, if you, if you go by our display board before you leave, there's a little video. I'm not sure what time I'm supposed to be done, but I almost passed my time. Um, okay, there's a there's a uh, a picture of the church building there. Pastor John uh, went up to Kaboom and really just just he was a national. He's not from the area, which you you and I can't tell them apart. They all look the same. They can tell each other apart. And they know when you're from this area when you're not. Went up there in a very very strong Lutheran area. Believe it or not, the Germans were there years and years ago. And so the, Ger the Lutherans were, they may be nice and friendly on TV, but there they were not friendly to him at all. Tried to run him out of town. Family suffered, a lot of sickness, a lot of, a lot of issues. But the Lord through it is greatly blessed. And he's, he's probably got a building that can seat 60 people. He puts 100 in there and they all sit on the floor. And there's probably more people that want to come. Out of that, they've started, over there they call them fellowships. We would call them church plants. And they call them fellowships because they're, they're attached to a church until they're able to be on their own. And then they call them a church. 
He's got about five of those out of his church up in that little area called Kaboom. It's called Kaboom because the Japanese used to store ammunition there during the war. Kaboom. <laughs> True story. And so they, 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 he's got these areas. He personally made a call to me. He said, Brother Wayne Fair was supposed to be coming up to help. We built a, a, a prophet's chamber of sorts. It's a two-room house on the back of the church for him. He said, and it looks like time is just running out for him. He said, he may be able to come help me for a year or two. He said, but man, I've got about 40 to 50 men that are hungry to learn the Bible, that want to reach their people, that want to climb these mountains. And he, it's steep, but those men are raised on them. They can do it. He said, would you pray about coming and helping us too? And so that'll, that'll be another open door from the city of Mount Hogan to get up there, like I said, about an hour and a half plane ride. It's not something we couldn't do and be up there regularly to help him, and we'd love to do that. And there's a man there, also, lastly, another man right outside the city of Mount Hogan, Pastor Philemon, named after the guy in your Bible, Philemon. And he's, boy, he's endured some things, too. We won't go into all that, but he lives about an hour outside of the city of Mount Hogan, and not knowing anything about our ministry, not knowing what the Lord has called us to do, not knowing those pastors, not very close geographically to those pastors. Because when I say an hour, I mean driving. That's probably, what, five hours of walking for them. So that's not, you know, that's not something you just go hang out for a weekend. <laughs> he, uh, he, not knowing any of that, began uh, one day to, to, the Lord began to deal with his heart, and a few of the pastors in his close region, about the idea of we need to train our men. Uh, in the words of Pastor Fred, the, the second man on that video, he said, listen, we've seen so many American missionaries come and they've done such good work, but it's time for us. It's time for us to do the work. And, and, and they're in agreement. They want to reach their people with, for Jesus Christ and praise the Lord. Pastor Philemon, he, he began to build a building, a little small, small little Bible school building. And a missionary friend of mine went through there just to visit him one day. And he said, hey, what, what is this building? He said, uh, we're going to start a Bible school. He says, what, what, tell me about it. He goes, I don't know anything about it. All I know is the Lord said, build that building. And we're going to try to do what I can. He goes, I, I really don't know what I'm going to do or how I'm going to do it or who's going to help me do it. But uh, we're going to get it done. <laughs> and he said, well, let me tell you about a friend of mine that's coming here. And I, and I know him. I know Philemon. But he just didn't know we were coming. And he said, man, I'd sure love that. I'd love if they'd come help me too. So what I'm trying to communicate to you is, is there's more work. And we're not even there yet. <laughs> there's more work that we can do. And so we ask you to pray for us. One last thing, and I'll, and I'll close. The, um, the country of Papua New Guinea is the east side of the island. It's an island split right down the middle. Second biggest island in the world. Uh, I don't care about the first because God didn't call me there. But it's the second biggest. <laughs> it's split right down the middle. The west side is closed. By that I mean the government does not allow any Christians in whatsoever. And that includes the Catholics and all of them. Um, it is it, West Papua, the west side of the island, belongs to the nation of islands known as Indonesia. Indonesia has more Muslims per capita than any other nation on the planet. Go to the Middle East, throw a dart at the map, Indonesia wins every time. And I don't know why that is. They hide on the islands, they do whatever, I don't know. There's more, there's more people there than we realize. But West Papua is closed. You, now, there was a great missionary work happened on that half of the island when it belonged to the Netherlands and to the Dutch and stuff. But now it's closed. You cannot get in there. If you go in there and you sneak in and you preach the gospel, they don't care if you're an American or not, you'll go to jail. Um, but right now in the, city, in, the, in the country of West Papua, which belongs to Indonesia, there's a movement coming up. And I'm not big into politics, but you pay attention when some things happen. The country of West Papua has a movement called the Free West Papua Movement. And it's going to go before the United Nations probably in the next two to three years. They've got signatures of over half the population that has admitted that they believe that that nation was, was inappropriately given to Indonesia. That's how the war, you know, after these World War II and all these other wars, we just divvied up third world countries to whoever, you know. And they believe that they should have their independence. And they are at the point, because of the oppressiveness of Islam and because of the Indonesian overreach, they're in the verge of a civil war. And they'd really like the United Nations to just grant them their independence so they don't have to. But they have communicated very clearly that if you don't, we'll go to war over this. 
And here's all I'm telling you is I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of people dying if they ha- don't have to in a war. But if it frees up that border, when the Soviet Union fell, when that war fell, when that wall fell, man, we saw missionaries from this country going by the droves. Every missionary they would call you during that time, call them in Eastern Europe somewhere, and we were excited for it. After they raised support, two or three years on the road. I'm not telling you this is what God is doing, but it just seems interesting that there's one half of the island that is on the verge of declaring they want freedom. They see their neighbor right across the border, Papua New Guinea, getting all this aid and getting all this help and, and the freedom they have, and they want that. And if, boy, if God would open that border and have, I don't know, a hundred men, let's just, let's just estimate, who had been trained in the gospel ministry on this half of the island, who ate those same foods and lived in those same conditions and could climb those mountains, and those were their, basically their own countrymen, God could do something much quicker than getting missionaries in America on deputation for three or four years. Amen. I'm not telling you that's what God's doing. I'm just telling you something to pray about. Pray for West Papua. I'm not telling you God's called me to West Papua, but God might call some of those men he's called us to help train to West Papua. And we'd love to see God do a work there. Amen? Amen. So we're the Cermak family, and we ask you to pray for us. Our boys will give you cards here in a minute, and uh, I, think I'll, I think I'll end there. Uh, anybody got any questions before we're done? <clears throat> not not officially um they they may if you go up into the mountains that border becomes a little little less regulated you know but you got to go way up into the bush and really know the bush and the line will get blurred but nobody's sneaking into west papua if anything they might be sneaking out but most of those people up in the bush are just kind of their own yeah so What's that? I'm sorry. That's that's the plan. Um, we're going to go in April, my wife and I, and uh, sit with those pastors in the city of Mount Hagen. And those men are, you know, a lot of those are national men. And so we'll really rely on their insight. Um, I know in New Guinea, to answer your question with an illustration, uh, Brother Wayne Farrow, he took Bibles there, and he was going to give Bibles out. And what he found out when he gave out probably the first 50 Bibles is those 50 Bibles were all over the place. They were in the roads, they were in the outhouses, they were everywhere. And so what he made him start doing was working two hours a day in his garden to get a Bible. And then those Bibles, man, nobody would drop it. Nobody. So it's kind of one of those things, you, you make your kid work for it or you give it to them. So those pastors, I'll rely on them. Whether or not if you just give free classes, will it be taken as seriously as if you maybe charged them a small amount to cover the guy? So that'll be kind of more up to the pastors. We will not take anything for it, but will it help the church and their facilities? I don't know. So, sorry, I don't have a clearer answer. But uh, if somebody wants something, they'll invest in it. But we don't want to make it unreachable for them, too. So, what's the language over there? It's called uh, Indonesian Talk Pigeon. It's a conglomeration of about seven other major languages: English, Spanish, German, Japanese. Uh, bunch of tribal words in there um, my wife actually knows it she learned it when she was there she can read it or she you know, she can read it and speak it on about writing it but uh, it's it's on it they say never learned it but they say on a scale of one to ten it's like a two on how hard it is to learn so we're, we're hoping to learn it I sit sometimes and read the pigeon Bible out loud and she just laughs at me so pray for me that I'll get better help <laughs> so anybody else all right, that's all I've got, Pastor. All right, well, we're going to have a word of prayer, and then we're going to try to finish it off. Thank you. Father, thank you so much for today. We thank you for all you've done for us. I just pray now that you'll guide and direct in the service to come follow. We thank you for uh, these that are going to go with Papua New Guinea. And, Father, we just uh, pray, Lord, that you take and guide and direct them. Father, let's. Thank you so much for today. Just pray now that you'll guide and direct every aspect of this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to start church in about, about seven minutes.